Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining the FANEC Fan History Zoom. Today, our topic is Boston fandom in the 1960s. Uh, our panel is being moderated by Mark Olson, uh, who is the chairman of Nariskan 3, a stalwart of FANEC, and the, runs the fancyclopedia.org website, uh, providing um, context for all the original materials that are archived. Take it away, Mark. Well, welcome. Um, I'm also, I'm, I'm identified as a Boston fan, but I only arrived, moved here in the late 70s. So I am intensely curious about what, what happened to create the vibrant group of people that I met when I moved here. And I'm hoping to find out. Um, I, I'd like you to just go ahead and introduce yourselves. Tell us a little bit about how you got here. Tony, how about you first? Okay, I got into fandom sometime around 1950, before I even moved to Boston. But after I got to Boston, 1957, to MIT, I joined the MIT Science Fiction Society, which had been uh, founded in 1947, but didn't come into existence until 1949. Um, and that gives you some idea Prior to that, there was a group called the Stranger Club in the late 30s and early 40s, which included a lot of uh, older fans. Uh, Hal Clement, Harry Stubbs was uh, one of the members, and they were honored at Norris Khan as the, the fan guest. But as for me, um, I was active in uh, uh, Mitzvahs. I was the onsec, uh, the clerk. Uh, and librarian. Uh, I was the one who pushed through getting the uh, collecting non English language science fiction magazines, of which Mitzvahs has, I believe, the largest collection probably in the world. Uh, after graduating, we decided we wanted to do more fanish things. We had gotten connections with New York and Los Angeles. Uh, we needed a group that was um, more permanent than a, a collegiate group. And that led to Bosphus and Nesma. I wasn't very active in Bosphus at all, but I was one of the 25 founders of Nesma. Uh, and that's a little bit about me. Leslie? Okay. Maybe Mike should go next to keep okay, it. Okay, Mike. Okay, just in, just in sequential order. Yeah, I, I was not in active, active in fandom. In fact, I hardly knew anything about it uh, before I came to MIT in uh, September of 1962. And, uh, but I was a science fiction reader and I had a collection and all of that sort of stuff, like any tech oriented kid in uh, that, that time. I grew up in Northern Virginia. So going to uh, Boston and living there for five years was a shock. But uh, the fact of the matter is I was born in Worcester, Massachusetts, so probably it wasn't too bad. Anyway, um, I, I came there with the intention of going to MIT and becoming an academic, and that uh, changed after a few years at MIT and getting sucked into mitzvahs and to fandom and discovering a whole lot more interesting things to do with my life. So those are the good things. I think I can truly say that fandom has been very good to me. I'm still an active fan. And I still go to conventions. We went to Pemicon this year. We'll be going to Glasgow next year. Uh, I was active in uh, mitzvahs. Uh, when I started, I was simply reading. And by the time I was a senior, I was the, the uh, Skinner of uh, mitzvahs, which is the name that we use for somebody who was nominally in charge of the organization. Given how anarchic mitzvahs is, being in charge of an organization like mitzvahs is kind of a, of a yes and no or proposition. But while I was there, I did a lot of things that uh, got us into uh, more active communication with people outside the Boston area, outside of MITS, outside of the MIT Society Organization University in particular. But uh, I managed to uh, get on um, the list and became a grad student at MIT. So, I actually stayed for another year and a half after I graduated. And 
left just at the founding of mitzvahs. So I think I'm one of the original 25 as well. And uh, I did manage to make it to a couple of uh, Nesva meetings before I left for California and never came back. <laughs> I was still a member of Nesva for the next 20 years, but eventually I decided I wasn't going to come to meetings very often. In fact, the next meeting that I made was an unfortunate one, which was just after Bosco and it had some problems with some of its attendees. Um, Nesvins can talk about that, but probably that's a topic for another conversation. While I was there, I met uh, people like uh, Ed Meshkis uh, from California and eventually from uh, New Hampshire, a bunch of New Yorkers and a whole bunch of people from areas that I was not familiar with, namely the students and other people at MIT. And I'll let Leslie. Um, well, I'm similar to you. I didn't really know about fandom when I was younger, um, but I did read science fiction. I read everything. It wasn't just science fiction, but I was kind of a nerd. Um, they didn't have the word nerd in those days. I believe I was called an egghead. Um, and I was living in Connecticut, and then we moved to Minnesota when I was applying to college. And my I thought about applying to MIT, um, but my my dad thought I should be more well-rounded. So he encouraged me to apply to Harvard, Radcliffe at that time. And I didn't really expect to get accepted, but what the heck. And in fact, I did get accepted. So that was kind of exciting. Um, so I came to college and uh, <laughs> I found Harvard, I was a little bit of a fish out of water. I found Harvard a little bit on the pretentious side. And in the very first week, um, my roommate decided she didn't want a room with me. She wanted a room with somebody else. And so um, the somebody else's roommate was also being rejected. And we were asked if the two of us minded rooming together. And I said, sure, fine, why not? So that was great. That was fortuitous because my roommate turned out to be Corey Seidman, who is now Corey Panchin. And um, we shared um, many interests. Um, she introduced me to Lord of the Rings. Um, we're friends um, distantly to this day. So then a little bit later in the year, let's see, I came to college in the fall of 63. Um, more toward the spring, we met another uh, person in our dorm, Sue Hereford, who um, had actually been to a Lossus meeting. So she knew about fandom and she knew that there was a fanish group uh, at MIT. Of course, Harvard would never do anything quite that silly you know harvard harvard was too serious for science fiction so we trekked down to um the spofford room at mit at five o'clock on friday afternoon um and learned of all the silly customs and behaviors of the mit fans and i realized i had found my true home um, i fit right in i loved it um and we became members um ended up editing the fanzine edit ended up um running i ended up running a boss cone later a world con um and i'm you know still have friendships that i've made in fandom to this day um i'll say fandom made an incredible impression on me because in those days women didn't get to run things and i was kind of shy and not very sure of myself and in fandom we were allowed to do stuff that we weren't allowed to do in regular life and it gave me a lot of self-confidence and um particularly running a world con. <laughs> After you run a world con, everything else seems easy by comparison. So um, I, I, I owe a lot to fandom. So you, you, all, you all talk about MIT and mitzvahs. Uh, was there anything else in Boston besides MIT and mitzvahs? Was that the be all and end all of Boston fandom at the time? At least until the mid sixties, yes. That's pretty much the case, Tony. There was a group founded by Al, not by founded by her, but there was a group called the International Interplanetary Exploration Society that John Campbell had set up. And the local group was run by Alma Hill. And it never really did very much except gave a few talks. The only one I remember was one given by Alma's brother, who was a chemist on gelatin. It was a fascinating talk, but it had nothing to do with science fiction. And, and keep in mind that 
Misfits weren't, they weren't really fans, or at least they claimed they weren't really fans. That was their slogan. We're not fans. We just read this stuff. And they had a fantastic library, which Tony had a lot to do with um, creating. And uh, that was their main interest um, until Dave Vanderwerf turned up. And he had been to World Cons. He was an MIT dropout. Um, he had been to World Cons. He wanted to have World Con in Boston. He wanted to have conventions in Boston. And he really was the impetus for all those early um, attempts. Uh, I call them attempts because some of them didn't work out really well. <laughs> but it was the beginning. So, so what happened there? Uh, uh... I, I know I've heard of something called Boscus, which was involved in that, that Worldcon bid, and it, it sort of went away, and that's really all I know. I well, think it's fair to say that in the in the early 60s, uh, we were uh, people in mitzvahs, although we had a fairly insular outlook about uh, science fiction, we slowly became aware of what else was going on, and Vanderwerf was part of it, and for sure. And we started reading fanzines, and a couple of us went to conventions, local conventions, and things got more and more interesting. It just sort of grew upon us that there was a, another world out there that we could be in contact with. Also, Tony was uh, trading books with uh, fans, uh, also professionals around the world at this point, just beginning, but just uh, it was all, all happening at the same time. Someone uh, mentioned on chat, uh, Filthy Pierre, uh, Irwin, Irwin Strauss, but we'll call him Pierre. Uh, he uh, came, um, I think he his, he was uh, class of 65, as I recall. He was a year a year ahead of me, I think. But uh, he knew something about this. I'm not sure how. Does somebody else want to say anything? Oh, I, I think there was some... Um... It got to the point where there were a lot of the movers and shakers and mitzvahs were not actually MIT or students. <laughs> um, and I, it did not it did not escape the notice of the MIT administration. And I think they weren't terrifically thrilled by having this influx of, of non-students, non-MIT people in, in the club. And I think that's part of the reason um, there was a push to form a separate club just to kind of stay under the radar and not get Mitzvahs into trouble. I mean, the biggest issue was the um, when Filthy Pierre published his index. Um, originally, there had been a previous index to science fiction magazines done by Donald Day up till up to 50, was it? 50. Yeah. And, 50, you know, we had... 30 to 50, sorry. We had all this fantastic technology now. We had punch cards and these machines you could run them to through that would sort them and print them. And uh, so um, Filthy Pierre got this project going and he enlisted a bunch of us. I, I remember I helped type punch cards um, and um, it was gonna be published under the auspices of the MIT Science Fiction Society. Um, so it's called the MIT, the Misfits Index um, from 51 through 65, was it possibly? Yeah. And um, they have applied to their uh, board well, to get funding there's, to- there's, there's, take, there's another yeah. step. There's another step in here first that um, there were eight titles. He did a, a mimeographed version of this, which we right. ran off on the ones that Burton House, uh, uh, Gestetner, um, it was published uh, uh, backside forward it was like a, a an ace double uh, kind of by accident black and blue ink and that was very popular amongst uh, people outside MIT outside in fandom in general so Pierre got the idea well we could make a real book out of this since as far as we could tell nobody was actually doing it and there was a great great lack and then that was when our problems began because to do this we'd need to hire a printer a real printer and that could be done outside and uh, Pierre was uh, somehow going to be paid for some of his work. And that caused a little problem with the art with MIT. Pierre was not in the best of terms with MIT anyway. He'd been thrown out for a year for a uh, thing involving the technology textbooks uh, associates, which uh, we have to go into. That's an entirely different discussion. He was a pioneer in copyright, let us say. 
<laughs> but, he, but they let him back in. He was and, very uh, inventive. He had many interesting ideas. Pierre was just full of ideas. <laughs> Gambling uh, cruise ships, gambling cruise ships just outside the continental limit. Um, Long before the, uh, the the tech bros thought of this idea. Yeah, he was, yeah. He was building an island uh, off in the Pacific where people could set up an anarcho uh, anarcho capitalist uh, political state. Again, this is topic for another conversation. But yeah. anyway, he did this and. Uh, he used the, the uh, we agreed that he would use the collection and we would somehow be the uh, fostering organization for it. And everything sort of worked fine for a long time. I want to say here that I did a lot of the uh, English, uh, the obscure English magazines, because during the summers I was back working in uh, the Washington DC area and I joined WISFAS, WISFA, the Washington Science Fiction Association. And uh, a guy there named, um, uh, I've forgotten his name, Don, um, had a, had been working in England and came back with an almost complete collection of British magazines. So so I'm actually in the credit line, too. <laughs> well, as as I recall, it was they he was Mrs. was going to apply for funding to pay the printer, to pay the printing costs. And then they would sell them the books and make money from them. And MIT put their foot down at that point and said, no, nope, we're not going to have anything to do this. We don't want our name on this. He literally, the books had already been printed at that point. He literally had to take black magic marker and cross out MIT Science Fiction Society on the cover um, of any of the ones that were still remaining. Um, so I guess I, I guess I'll go on and tell this is jumping ahead in time, but this is relevant to, to NESFA. Um, somewhere around, I believe it was, let me look at my timeline, 68 or so, or no, 67. Um, he had the unfortunate um, situation that he got drafted and yeah. um, the, the, he hadn't paid for the, the printer and the printer repossessed the books and was sitting on them. And of course, had no idea how to market them or anything. And we were afraid they were just going to pulp them. And that was right around the time Nessa was getting formed. So we got the brilliant idea of making a very low ball offer to the printer to buy the books for 50 cents each, figuring that would be better than pulping them. And it worked. <laughs> so we bought something like, what was it, 1,500 books? Yeah, at yeah. he cents? originally printed 2,000 and- yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, you had some of them, Mike, right? Yeah, well, actually um, I was uh, Pierre's roommate for a year and uh, we were using those uh, boxes of books as furniture for a while. But, I've uh, been in that apartment. That's where yeah, Texas is now. 116 Broadway, completely yeah. torn down and replaced by the Marriott Hotel and all of the, yeah, the yeah, tech yeah. buildings. But but yeah, a slum. And uh, we were using it for furniture. And uh, Pierre got drafted. And I sold a bunch of them and uh, was trying to arrange for Nesva to take them when uh, the whole legal thing with the printer uh, took over. And I said, goodbye. The book left. <laughs> So we bought them for 50 cents each and we sold them for $8 each. And that basically funded the first, you know, multiple years of Nesva's existence, which really, I think helped, you know, make it a success because we weren't, we weren't tight for money. We could afford to, you know, put on conventions and not worry too much about where the money was coming from. So you can start your own publishing company. <laughs> and then yes, later we did, but I think that's beyond I think the first book Nesva published was in the 70s, so that's outside of our, our discussion uh, today. Did, did, did some mimeograph supplements to the index. Yeah, I did one of, of them. I had a Stephen Fabian cover, and um, yeah. All you needed was labor, you know, people typing in the... We also did an index to the U.S. edition of Perry Rodin. Which, strangely enough, sold out on hotcakes. And Cordwainer Smith, that was that was a better one. Yes. <laughs> yeah. so what did we skip so, over when I skipped ahead? Well, we haven't talked about people. Um, well, I came up with some unforgotten people. Um, 
I don't know, we sh should we talk about who was who else was active in Nesva? Uh, sorry, in uh, mitzvahs at that time, sure. people who were uh, doing things. I mean, yeah. anybody you remember? Um, I don't. Well, there were people like Doug Hoyleman yes. and uh, Jim Dor are people that I remember. Yeah, uh, who were who were writing uh, regularly for the uh, Twilight Zine. Uh, Dick Harder, who I I'm really sorry is not with us. He was one of the, the stalwarts of mitzvahs at that time. Tony knows him better than I do, but I, I got to know him pretty well. Potter died a few years ago. Yeah, it's too bad, because yeah. we're still his alive. His website but... is still there, though. Yes. And there's a lot of really fun and interesting stuff on there. What's uh, going to say? Um, Hoyleman. Hoyleman was six times national crossword puzzle champion. Yeah. He um, after he graduated from MIT, he became an actuary, and in addition to doing crossword puzzles, he went on Greyhound bus tours in different cities. That was his major activity. <laughs> uh, Jim Dore uh, is still a poet, uh, and suppose and adds to his income by doing computer programming. Um, so to speak. Uh, I was, okay. I got married and he went back to South Dakota, got married. I went out there to be his best man. Uh, it was a very small wedding. And then a couple of years later, I went out for his funeral. And that was not as pleasant. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> other people, do you people remember Drew White? Yep. Oh, yeah. Was he a member of this? Was Yes, he was. Yeah. No, he was not. No, not, a, not a well. He's not an MIT student. No, he's, yeah, another one of the. He's a Bob, forgotten. Bob Weiner was, who is now uh, yep. publisher well, of some of them grant books. Fuzzy Pink. Fuzzy Pink. She was one of the founding own. members. Right. And she's now married to uh, Larry Niven. Right. With so Larry husband. and Alexei Patchett are what we call writers-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> Well, with Fuzzy Pink, we used to um, go to her apartment to watch Star Trek. She had a color TV. Yeah, she yeah. had a. She was the only color TV around. So. And uh, she had met Larry at a at a Lunicon, the Lunicon where he won a Hugo. So he was in a great mood. No, no, no um, not a Hugo. Worldcon. Didn't World she meet him? At uh, Worldcon. Worldcon. Sorry, him at uh, Nikon. I believe. Yeah. Nikon. And so he oh. came a couple of times to our Star Trek gatherings when he was traveling back to Cambridge to woo her. And um, we got to read um, some of his stories before they were published, which was pretty exciting. I think I remember reading um, the organ leggers at one of those get togethers. So that was fun. And Corey, Corey of course, married Alexei Panshin, and they went on to publish um, the, the two of them together, The World Beyond the Hill, which won a Hugo. Um, I'm trying to think who else I knew from back then. Well, it's Ed Meyer, who's founded. Yeah. Well, okay, well, that's that's, uh, that's yeah. Uh, no, well, um, Schultz and Dooley. Oh yeah, can't forget them. Schultz, Dooley, and Esther. Esso, because uh, they were from BU. Right, he's gone. Yeah. From uh, Ro from Rochester, New York. The talking beer mugs of Rochester. Um, J. Martin Gretz, who I uh, was, uh, you're, you knew him, I think. Yes, he was, uh, he was even before us. Uh, he was an early member, and he actually had published a science fiction story set in MIT called Building Nine, which was the headquarters for the Department of Magic. Um, yeah. At the time, there was no Building Nine at MIT. All the other there was uh, all no the Department of Magic at that time either. There all, was um, all there the was... section. All, all of MIT is divided into buildings by number, or was. Right. It's now changing, but uh, it's a uh, and the Building Ten was the the building over the Central Dome. The first uh, you may see a picture of it later, but Building Nine never existed. And yeah. there was a guy named Mike Shupp who became oh, yeah. 
a, he, he wrote a few science fiction novels. And I'm remembering particularly there was one novel he wrote where at the beginning of the story, the, the hero is an MIT student in an MIT dorm. And suddenly the whole world starts shimmering outside because there's some cosmic event happening. And he goes, you guys, you're playing a hack on me. <laughs> So uh, uh, Gretz has did two other things that are uh, notable. Uh, he was one of the f uh, creators of Space War mm -hmm. and wrote about it for creative computing. So that's how his name has managed to survive. He's uh, uh, been noted as one of the creators, one of the first uh, uh, computer games or video games. And another thing that he did was he sold us, he sold Mitzvah's his collection of weird tales, which uh, Tony, were you involved in that? No. Okay. It that happened on your watch. Time, I, think. I think it was Gretz. I think it was him. Um, which uh, caused us to go uh, look for money to bind them because we didn't want to have them out loose where people would tear them up. And that caused us to uh, go make a bid for $4,000 from the MIT Finance Board to bind them and bind up other magazines and do other things, which they gave us. Uh, astonishingly, this was when I was the Skinner and Tony was the uh, the expert, and uh, it's it uh, put MIT it put Mitzvahs on its path of actually accommodating to the uh, institute's uh, political organization as before it had been kind of uh, a uh, wet child off on the side. The uh, Mitzvahs library started with a uh, donation of books from John W. Campbell, bound copies of the Sounding, and on microfilm. And I think they're probably still in a box in the library somewhere. You so, know, the, the cards that went into making up the index got stored away in various people's houses for many, many, many years until at some point, I think it was determined they were so tattered that they probably wouldn't be able to be read by any machine anymore. But Well, the way Pierre had printed out his index was he had an IBM, he went to the IBM 407, took off the ribbon, and he had uh, taped to the paper Mimeo stencils, which he then ran through the machines. So it gives you an idea of what sort of hack he thought were of. Um, well, that was the first index, not, but the second one was right. was was photo. The second uh, one was photo offset. Yeah, the real the photo offset for a real printout by Spalding Moss, the printer. The so, reason it was the early one, the blue and black decks, was run off on a Gestetna in Burton House, was that Burton House had a Gestetna, Jonathan Gestetna. And he was in the family that owned the we company. We had a person, England, Gestetner. I and said, he yes. said, you need a Gestetner. He gave one to the dormitory. Cool. So which we use. I was yeah. thinking maybe we should talk about bus cones a little. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I also want to mention the, uh, some forgotten people. But okay. we can do that later if you want. Oh, go but, ahead. Well, uh, one of the kind of forgotten people is Dave Vanderwerf, who you alluded, yeah. alluded to earlier, because uh, he dropped out. But unlike many MIT dropouts, he didn't come back. Mm -hmm. A lot of people came and, and went. They were thrown out. They came back. Um, but one of the people that uh, was another MIT dropout was the guy who got me really active in uh, mitzvahs was Dennis Guthrie, oh. who uh, Tony remembers. You probably don't re You may not have met him. Uh, Leslie, but uh, uh, Dennis and I, uh, one night after Dave Vanderwerf had uh, not published Twilight Zine for uh, two years, as far as we could tell, we decided that, well, if he wasn't going to do it, we'd do it ourselves. And that was the origin of TZ14, which was a parody issue, which then got people interested in in Twilight Zine again, if for no other reason, just, just to make sure that Dennis and I didn't do another one. I will say that that's a recurring theme in Dave's Spanish career. I'll, I'll give some other examples as we go along. Dave showed up at Bosco at 50. Yeah, he did. Yeah. After being away for years and years and years. Yeah. 
there's some uh, bookseller who uh, uh, ran across. He was doing a package. I can't remember his name, but he was he had a package to sell Boston fanzines to a couple of universities, and he ran across the mention of Dave Vanderwerf and said, who is this guy? And I think, did he go to some Nesfa meetings too? Brad, I think, Brad with an H something. Oh, Werner. Huh? Ver- Vertner? Um, that doesn't sound right to me, but. Oh. Okay, there Sorry, was a I Brad think it was that was from Harvard who was collecting stuff for a Harvard library. Yeah, and also. Um, oh, Brad Verter. Brad Verter, yeah, that's right. You're right, you're right. And, uh, he uh, decided he would see if he could find Dave, and he did. Hmm. Well, and, Dave, you know, as I said, you know, he had this dream of, you know, bringing a world con to Boston and running uh, local conventions, and he organized the first Boscone. Um, that was in the fall of 65. He had the idea that um, there would be two a year. They'd be in fall and in spring. And... Um, the one, the first one was much smaller than he anticipated. He had told the hotel, you know, there, it would be like a Lunacon, be several hundred people. I think there were like, I don't know what the official count was, 66 or something like that. It was, it was one might, it was sad, uh, but we had fun and we did it again in the spring and there were a few more people. And then when the following fall rolled around, it was clear that doing it twice a year was not a great idea. So he backed off and decided it would be just once a year in the spring. However, um, Phil Z. Pierre didn't like that idea. He wanted to continue. So he held one in the fall um, that was really not what we think of as a convention. It was at MIT. It was a series of speakers. It wasn't like people were staying in a hotel. I did not go to that. I didn't consider it a boss cone. And um, at this point, it's the only boss cone I never attended. And so I can't say I've been to every boss cone. And had I but known, I would still be here 60 years <laughs> later. I would have gone, but I didn't. So, Well, I went to it. It was easy. And uh, John Campbell was uh, speaking. I think he was sponsored yeah. by MIT. And I built, uh, Pierre built it around him and some other tech speakers. And it was fine. And there weren't really parties. It really wasn't a convention, but there were parties for those of us who were actually involved in it. But I missed the first one because mm-hmm. uh, after because uh, I was uh, in '67. I was uh, I I was working on my uh, master's thesis, and among other things, I went home for a vacation in uh, the Northern Virginia area. And uh, during that time, Bosco and one was organized and held before I could get back. So. So that's why I'm not in the first Bosco, right. but I was part of Bosco and two, and Bosco and three, and then I was gone. Oh, there was a question from the uh, from the group uh, about George Flynn. When when did he get involved? Uh, George was uh, involved after Nespa was founded. Yeah, and recall he was very active in on the Nuriscon two uh, and working for Nuriscon. Yeah, but I think it wasn't until the 70s that he really yeah. got into things. Uh, I want to mention, I have, I'm just going to say, I have two more quick quick mentions. Mm-hmm. Uh, Professor Robert Rafius. Bob Rafius was our faculty advisor, which I didn't even know we had until <laughs> we had the contraton with uh, uh, Alma Hill. And uh, she asked to talk to our faculty advisor, and we discovered who he was. And he was a great guy. And in fact, uh, he and I got to talking and I ended up uh, working for him as a grad student and did my thesis for him. So I'm happy. He was a science fiction fan, of course. Uh, who else was going to be the faculty advisor of the science fiction club? And the Galvin brothers haven't been mentioned. Mm. And they were involved. They were among our first uh, outreach uh, members of the or- of Bosphorus. And they were really good guys. Yeah, Paul's on the... Um... One of the seven people who signed the incorporation papers that I was just looking at this morning. So yeah, he and he ran, I think, Bosco three or four somewhere. No, I'm not three because that was Pilsy Pierre. Four, four probably. Uh, four, I think. I think yeah. it was four. Yeah. And I don't know what happened to them though. After. One I think died in an auto accident, but I don't know which one it was. And mm. I don't know if that's actually what happened. Um, you, you but they you were very active in uh, 
Nur Ish Khan won. Yeah. You, you mentioned Asimov. Uh, yes. I, 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 when I moved here, there were stories about the good old days when Asimov was a member. Uh, what, what was his involvement? Isaac attended the Lesbian meetings. Well, Asimov and Howard Clement uh, yeah. came to uh, Mitzvah's uh, picnics, which we had every yeah. spring. And uh, gosh, Fuzzy, Fuzzy, I remember one year, which must have been 65 or 66, Fuzzy had a, a Polaroid camera and took a lot of color pictures of the, of the picnic. And I wonder if she still has them, if, the, if she mm. and, if, and Larry have them somewhere. Those would be that great. That would be to great. See. We yeah. can see those. Anybody's in contact with I you. think um, Isaac wasn't never involved in convention running per se. You know, he would come by and talk to people. Um, Hal was more, he would actually volunteer to do stuff. In fact, he was originally the treasurer of Norris Khan One until one of his books got nominated. And in those days, we didn't have a separate Hugo committee. In fact, I think that was one of the impetuses to have a separate Hugo committee. So he felt he needed to resign from the Khan committee. He was going to have a Hugo nomination. Um, so, well, actually, yeah. He was going to withdraw his book from contention. Uh, oh, that is that was easy. <laughs> Well, in any case, convinced him to <laughs> resign instead. So we got someone else to fill in. And um, yeah, he, so he was, he, they were they were both good guys. Fred Isaacs, I think, became treasurer. Yes, he did. That's how I got sucked in, because I was dating Fred at the time, and <laughs> I ended up being assistant treasurer, I guess. But we let Harry work on registration. Yeah. There is kind of one. Yeah. Are there when any, did, any other when questions, did, Mark? When did Spike McPhee's bookstore pop up? I, I, it was certainly here be, for quite a while by the time I moved uh, here. This, that was a couple of years after. Yeah. What was it, Tony? There's some noise. Um, I was typing. Maybe that heard. I was typing on the chat to Edie. Maybe you heard that. Um, Spike was uh, was Nesfa uh, after the transition. Yeah. So I, I I don't I only met him years later. But he had a bookstore called the uh, Million Year Picnic, was it? In was he involved in Norris Khan One, Tony? What? Was he involved in Norris Khan One? I don't recall. I don't think so. Uh, okay. One of the people involved in Oris Cottonwood who dropped out of bed was uh, Stu Brownstein. Oh, right. Uh, he was in charge of security, although he wanted his official title was Chief of Pigs. That's if you true. remember those, in those days, the theory was that anybody who wanted to run security was unfit to run security. That's, that's true. Well, Stu Brownstein moved out to California. Uh, he became yeah. active in yes. uh, local fandom in uh, Northern California. And mm -hmm. I knew him and uh, his wife for many years. And uh, in fact, uh, he ended up working, uh, this is really long connected story, but a company I worked for, the uh, the successor to that, Stu, uh, worked with the, the guy who'd run that. And uh, they they hired fans. That's a whole another thing. We should talk about Schlumberger Palo Alto Research someday on a fanatic thing because uh, the guy who... Uh, ran that, uh, met the photographer Katine at uh, the uh, first, at the second discon, and uh, eventually wound up hiring lots of fans for his AI research lab. And Stu Brownstein partnered with him to do a, another company later on. But Stu stayed in fandom, yeah. just on the West Coast. Going back to Mitzvahs, uh... We did bring in some writers. Uh, and when I was about nine years old, my father, who was in the uh, was an electrical engineer, was in a radio club. He, he was a ham uh, called Letters Two R Y, which gives you some idea of how long ago that was. Wow! Um, and he came back and he handed me this a copy of Needle by Hal Clement and said. 
My friend in the radio club said you would probably enjoy this. It doesn't, it's doesn't got real good science in it, and it doesn't have a lot of romantic trash. Well, it wasn't until years later I found out who his friend in the ro- radio club was. It was a guy called Hugo Gernsback. <laughs> uh, and Mitzvah wanted to bring someone up to speak, and I said, well, wait. I called my father and said, do you, do you think we can get Hugo Gerns back to come up? And he did, and brought his speech, which he had written out and passed out copies. And basically, we all followed along with responsive reading. <laughs> but before he gave his speech, he just natted on for an hour, roughly, about knowing people like uh, uh, Thomas Edison, and Nikola Tesla, and what they were like, and some of their idiosyncrasies. Uh, It was, of course, much more interesting than his talk, which was called A New Name for Science Fiction. (laughs) (laughs) My dad gave gave Mitzvahs a huge amount of money to buy duplicating things so we could produce Twilight Senior. Of course, it didn't have a name then, but that's where the money for the... uh, Gestetner and that we, uh, the Mimeo we had, were doing highlights in. Oh, wow. Yeah. As I say, my dad was a big uh, ham radio guy and he was a big Gernsback fan. And there was one time when I was a kid, I remember he was on TV being interviewed and my dad called me over to watch it. And he later gave me a, a gift as a birthday present, one of um, Gernsback's original books. So, um, yeah, I would have loved to have been on the, in on that. Ralph. Yeah. Yeah, before Ralph. Before he, uh, yeah. That sounds great. Long before my time though. Yeah. I um I saw a question there for me about women in the early days of Nesfa. Yeah. Um how many, what percentage? Well, I there are two numbers. One, there's a list online of the original members of Nesfa. Out of the twenty-five, eight of them were women. And of the people who actually signed the certificate, um, which required seven people, actually there were four women out of the seven. So, um, you know, fandom was pretty, pretty welcoming to women. Um, Who I, were the seven signatories? Tony and Sue, me and Corey, Paul Galvin, Fuzzy Pink, um, and Dave Vanderwerf. Huh. So blame us. <laughs> well, the funny thing about me was that although the ratio of men to women when I was there, was about 50 or 60 to one, uh, almost half of Mitzvah's membership was female. Interesting. You mean, the, yeah, the undergraduate body was like 10% women when I uh, came on as a freshman. It's now 50%. Yeah. So Excellent. that's changed a lot. But uh, the, there were a surprising number of women in Mitzvah's, which I thought was a great thing. So um, t- tell me a little more about uh, the, the early boss codes. I mean, when, once you got past boss code one, I, you know, how, how did you organize? I, I know how big boss codes were organized, but I have no idea how the early ones were. Well, so then, how, I wasn't involved in the boss codes until Nesfa took them over. Uh, well, uh, well, I, did, I was involved I peripherally. But... It was one program track. So that made it kind of easy. Um, there was certainly no, you know, divisions or anything like that. I'm trying to find, I've somewhere in here, I've got the program book. Ah, here it is. Yeah. Go six. Um, so let me see what I can find. Now that was, um, so there was a chairman, there was a program advisor who was Dave. Chairman was me. Um, there was a Tolkien Society program one evening. That was Ed Meskes. We didn't talk about Ed Meskes. Uh, yeah. No. Well, this was yeah. before Ed was blind. And um, he, he lived in New Hampshire. And we went up once to visit him, a whole bunch of us, 20 people sleeping on the floor and sharing one bathroom. It was fascinating. Uh, <laughs> but he started the Tolkien Society. So he organized a bit of program at the Boscone. Um, there was a program book. Um, 
somebody in charge of that. Sufer did Thank membership you. cards and hospitality suite. Ed Meyer did an award in plaque and Bill Desmond taping. And then they were about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 people in the committee. Joanne Wood was one. Uh, yeah. So there was, you know, Saturday afternoon, there was a question and answer session with Isaac, a report on the Mariner project by Lou, Louis Sutro of the MIT Instrumentation Lab, auction of black and white artwork and Isaac Asimov. I'm not sure what happened there, but there was a panel on the feminine viewpoint with Anne McCaffrey, Marion Zimmer Bradley, moderated by Hal Clement. And then just the evening Tolkien thing. And then there was uh, the next day, there was an auction, the, the award, which was presented by Isaac Asimov, the, uh, you know, the E.E. E. Smith Memorial Award. He talked by Jack Gaughan, who was a doll. I, he was a really good guy. The Future of the World Con, a discussion of the new plans for World Con rotation with Elliot Shorter, Fred Lerner, and others, moderated by Tony Lewis. What year was Bosco in six? Uh, 69. 69, yeah, that was a key year for NESFA. But, and I don't recall yeah. the membership, it was over 200 and something. So, I was on the committee that had been set up at, at the 68 World Con to investigate the possibility of a NASFIC. And we held program items at all the regional conventions to discuss it, not just at Bosco, at Lunacon, Westercon, et cetera, all of them. It was a, a bid for Boston in 71 on the back page. Yeah. Yeah. With a Don Simpson artwork. Yeah. So we. Well, uh, and we did present it, and that's what started the NASFIC. Um, Boston, the, uh, talk, talking about Boston bids, Boston bid for the 67 World Con. That's correct. Yes. Dave um, Vanderwerf was the chair of that bid. There didn't go very well. Bids. Well, it depends on what you mean by not very well, <laughs> because there were four bidders for that one, yeah. uh, and uh, Syracuse, Baltimore, and New York City. For the 67 New York one. Uh, we came in at the end. We didn't actually know what we were doing. I was on that committee. And uh, uh, we uh, we made a presentation at Tricon, a whole bunch of us. I think, Leslie, you were at Tricon, weren't you? My first Worldcon, yeah. Yeah, it was my first Worldcon, too. Um, Dave Vanderwerf gave a speech that was not well received. And uh, at the end of it, uh, I handed out a bunch of flyers for Boston in 1970. What happened to what happened to what? Well, all of a sudden, my machine is. We can hear you. Oh, there it is. Okay. So I just wanted you. to throw in a correction. I saw, I'm, I'm sorry I haven't read everybody's comments, but every so often I catch one. Um, Ed Meskes didn't, according to Fred Lerner, Ed Meskes didn't start the Tolkien Society of America. He took it over from Dick Plotz. So mm -hmm. I yeah, that, sounds right. that correction. Sorry. 